Hello, everybody. Uh, on behalf of Florida International University's Tropical Conservation Institute and our partnering panelists from One Earth Conservation, Defenders of Wildlife Mexico, the American Bird Conservancy, and the University of Georgia Infectious Diseases Laboratory, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first in a series of live webinars entitled Wildlife in a Changed World. My name is Paul Rilo, and, and I'm the director of the Tropical Conservation Institute at FIU and director of the Rare Species Conservatory Foundation, uh, TCI's principal partner here in Florida. Today, I'll be serving both as moderator and panelist for this webinar. Today's discussion, Parrot Conservation in Crisis, is intended to spark a broad discussion among parrot researchers, conservationists, the public, and policymakers, and everyone who cares about parrots and parrots' futures in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Please understand that we are not attempting here uh, to be an all-encompassing uh, Zoom chat session, but rather we're trying to get the ball rolling and, and we're aiming to advance an elevated dialogue about parrot conservation pre and post COVID-19. Please bear with us as this is as much a learning experience for us as, as we hope it will be for you. After our panelists introduce themselves briefly and their connection to parrot conservation, we're gonna be cycling through a series of topics, inviting panelists to draw on their experiences, to present what they consider to be the most important points in parrot conservation today. Along the way, we'll be collecting viewers' questions through Zoom Q&A, so please feel free to submit comments and questions, which time permitting, we'll address at the end, the end of the webinar. If time runs short or we have an overabundance of questions that we feel we should address, we'll schedule a follow-up webinar to allow panelists uh, to provide detailed answers on that. Without further delay, let me start by saying that, that my involvement in parrot conservation dates back more than 30 years. I have a degree in environmental engineering from Johns Hopkins, a PhD in ecological genetics from the University of Maryland. And with RSCF and, TS and TCI, um, I've been assisting recovery and conservation programs for a number of flagship species, including parrots. My personal work with parrots is focused primarily on in situ recovery and management of endemic Amazons from the Eastern Caribbean and Brazil. It's an absolute privilege to join this panel uh, to discuss parrot conservation today. It's an exceptional group of people. And among this group, our next um, speaker needs little introduction. Dr. Laura Kim Joyner, please tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Paul, and welcome everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a veterinarian specializing in conservation medicine and parrot conservation for over 33 years in the Americas. I'm also a Unitarian Universalist minister and a certified trainer in nonviolent communication. Right now, I'm serving as co-director of One Earth Conservation, and we have projects in eight countries in the Americas. And Juan Carlos, you're next. Uh, thanks, uh, Laura Kim. Well, I am uh, a biologist. I am the director of Defenders of Wildlife uh, in, in Mexico. And I have worked on the conservation of parrots for almost uh, 25 years, uh, specializing on trying to stop illegal trade and doing advocacy to get stricter rule regulations in, in Mexico to protect the uh, parrot. Parrots, and uh, I'm also uh, well. I do campaigns on um, parrot awareness, and uh, we also help in in situ conservation. And uh, internationally, uh, I have worked to try to stop the unsustainable trade of endangered parrots, especially through the uh, CITES Convention. And I'll pass it to Dan Levin. Hi everybody, my name is Daniel Levin and I'm Vice President of Threatened Species at American Bird Conservancy. American Bird Conservancy works with partners across Latin America and the Caribbean to conserve birds and their habitats. And this work includes many parrot projects for the hemisphere's most threatened species, benefiting parrots, uh, including creating nature reserves to protect their habitat, nest box programs, research, conservation planning, anti-trafficking and anti-persecution. I've been with ABC for 12 years and before that, I completed my PhD on Amazonian birds at um, Cornell University. Thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for giving us a, a quick snippet of your history with, with parents. Our first uh, question, more a broad um, discussion point, is what do you feel are the major issues in parrot conservation pre and post coronavirus? Laura Kim, you're first. 
Well, the, to me, the biggest issue is we're losing our parents and have so been so for decades. And this is largely due to the pet trade, which is largely international and is largely illegal. Now, we're doing all we can on frontline conservation, but it's not enough. We need the help of the international community to reduce the demand, which means stopping the trade in parrots everywhere now. And to do this, we really have to look at how the parrot trade is a form of neocolonialism and domination that's hurting people and parrots everywhere. Studies show that if we empower and trust local communities to make choices to care for themselves and their parrots, the conservation outcomes are greater. This means we need a more equitable sharing of Earth's resources to put it in the hands of the local people so that they can care for their lands and their, and their parrots. And this means that we need to be stronger. We need to be more courageous and more creative in political and economic reform so that people can care for their biotic communities, which means it's caring for all of us in this interconnected world. And we capture this intersection by saying none are free and to all are free. And finally, the last major issue that I have is that to be able to do all of this work, we have to work together and conservationists aren't so good at it. Uh, blaming, judging, demonizing the other, whether it's the poacher, the buyer, the conservationist, the agriculturist, the government worker, this is not helping. Studies have shown in one in particular that if we uh, see what causes failures in conservation, it isn't corruption, it isn't biological, ecological issues, it isn't lack of funding, it's the lack of social and emotional intelligence, the lack of social capital and conflict in between the communities. So we as conservationists aren't very aware of emotional and social intelligence, how to grow organizational intelligence, and we don't know much about multiculturalism or anti-oppression skills. This must change. And the pandemic is a great time to do this change as we look into growing the global awareness of how conservationists are providing essential services, and even more so now as their daily tasks get harder due to the pandemic. And uh, boy, I'd like to hear from Juan Carlos now what he thinks. Thank you, Laura. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what happen, uh, what's happening in Mexico. And basically, all the species are threatened by habitat destruction and illegal trade. But for some species, illegal trade is the main threat. And well, although international illegal trade was uh, very important many decades ago uh, here in Mexico, basically since the 1990s, uh, around 80 to 90% of the illegal trade is destined for the national domestic trade. That means uh, the poached uh, parrots are staying in, in Mexico. And uh, we estimated that uh, almost 80,000 parrots are being taken illegally each year. And uh, well, this has devastated the populations of parrots and uh, basically all 22 Mexican parrot species are at risk. 11 species are endangered, seven are threatened, and four are under special protection. Now in, two, in 2002, we were able to uh, put up a total ban on parrot trade in Mexico, that is, all capture, all imports, exports, and even breeding of Mexican species was completely banned. And in uh, 2017, it was estimated by the Environmental Enforcement Agency that thanks to the ban, illegal trade was reduced by around 24%. Now we estimated that uh, the uh, decrease was around 32%, but in any case, the ban is working. Now, uh, bans alone uh, don't decrease illegal trade. You have to work really, really, really hard and for a long time uh, to uh, tell the people and make them aware of what's uh, going on and uh, work on uh, public education uh, to get the uh, uh, illegal trade reduced. But bans do work. And uh, well, I think that um, illegal trade will continue to decrease after this uh, virus emergency is over because, well, people and government authorities are receiving lots and lots of information of the consequences of illegal trade. I mean, they, they are living it. 
And so I think uh, there's more awareness of the problem. And so people are going to start to demand more and more of the authorities to do something to stop uh, illegal trade. Okay, so now we go to Dan. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, the biodiversity crisis in general doesn't receive the attention it does. And so again, awareness of the troubles parrots face is a big issue. Many parrots are in trouble and parrots are one of the most threatened and diverse groups of birds in the world. In fact, there have been 18 parrot species and subspecies that have gone extinct worldwide since 1600. And today about 26% of species are threatened with extinction. So why are parrots in trouble? We've talked about parrot trade. Parrot trade is one of the major driving threats affecting both large populations and species with small populations. And habitat loss and degradation is another major driver of declining parrot populations. This includes the wholesale clearance of tropical forests for conversion to agriculture. And this eliminates broad landscapes, uh, the capacity of broad landscapes to sustain parrots. But also parrots, most parrots nest in tree cavities. And often it's the oldest and largest trees that provide these cavities. And these are usually the first trees cut for construction materials, or often they're also cut when poachers rob nests. And so this also diminishes the capacity of an otherwise intact habitat to maintain parrots. So there are a few other threats too that are worth mentioning. Uh, some parrots are persecuted and killed as agricultural pests by raiding corn, for example, some macaws do that. And then finally, we're seeing emerging, emerging threats associated with climate change. Wildfires, for example, the wildfires in Australia that are damaging habitats, droughts and wildfires in South America, and then devastating hurricanes hitting the Caribbean. And these, these additional threats further threaten to tip the balance for parrot populations that are already diminished or stressed by habitat loss and trade. Now, a lot of these threats still exist post-coronavirus, and these threats are continuing, but there um, are a few things that we're starting to see. It's, it's a bit early to tell all the different effects of the pandemic, but, um, one important point I think to note is that you may be seeing some reports of, of improved water pollution, improved air pollution, but the pandemic is likely causing a lot of short and long-term harm to wildlife in some places like Ecuador and Colombia and elsewhere. For example, we're starting to hear reports from our partners in South America about people fleeing hot zones and cities and job losses for the countryside. And this is creating more pressure via hunting and logging on wildlife in wild places. And it also might be possible that during the pandemic, there's reduced law enforcement and our partners, some of our partners are worried about increased land squatting, reserve invasion, and um, even in some cases, some death threats to forest guards. Um, some of our partners depend on uh, revenue from, from donors or volunteers associated with tourism and all the tourism lodges associated with our partner reserves are shut down at the moment. And so um, there are some financial concerns related to the pandemic. Um, travel restrictions in some of these countries have postponed field work until probably 2021. And of course, the ultimate concern is that as the pandemic spread, our worst fear is that we lose conservationists to the disease itself. You know, to me, this, this pandemic is a real wake up call on a number of fronts. As, as the panelists have discussed, we've had priorities set in parrot conservation for a long, long time. And, and while some of those efforts have been very successful, many have been piecemeal. And, and our biggest concern, I think, as a discipline has been trying to find ways to sustain those programs. That's a financial stressor, that's a personnel stressor, a capacity stressor. And that existed long before this coronavirus um, really hit the scene. We used to say that if the developed world caught a cold, the developing world caught pneumonia. So what happens when the world catches coronavirus? It's obviously going to have a devastating impact on developing countries and poor countries' abilities to carry these programs forward on their own. And for that reason, I really think the, the emerging priority in this field has to be developing ways to ensure long-term in situ program continuity. And by that, I mean we have to invest directly and considerably more than we have in the capacity building of our local partners and players and stakeholders. 
got to dispel this myth that local people do not have the capacity or the means or the intellect or the scientists to, to do this work because they do. And for decades, many of the most successful parent programs on, on planet Earth were, were championed by sovereign states, forestry divisions, forestry departments, local players who did their part and held that front line. That's not to say that they didn't help, have help from the rest of us and from the people on the outside. They did. But we've got to return to that priority. And we've got to give those people the tools they need now more than ever because we're at a very vulnerable point. We've also got to just call this for what it is and, and, and challenge uh, the collectors that are masquerading as, as conservation players, um, removing wild parrots from their habitats to cage them in far-flung places under the pretense of conservation and rescuing species is, is, is really an unconscionable act, particularly when we see the disproportionate allocations of resources, personnel, funding, and, and techniques for those, uh, those champions on the front line. Sovereignty is so, so important in conservation of all wildlife species. And we have to make sure that, that we um, do our part as NGOs, as scientists, as conservationists, to make sure that those local tools and expertise are there for the long haul. How we do that is going to be critical. And I think uh, we have to join together, as Laura Kim mentioned, and, and draw on our resources as a collective whole to make sure that we are doing the best job and that we're doing it transparently, that we're communicating how we are doing conservation science. And, and that means sharing program documents, that means sharing uh, ideas, that means vetting these proposals out in the open and making sure that we're following the money so it hits the ground effectively. Let's be practical. Let's be investing in those local um, solutions. And let's keep those parrots where they belong, which is in their range state. An excellent example of that, of course, is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service program for the Puerto Rican parrot, where um, all of the birds are conserved in situ. And that includes uh, some, some aggressive recovery measures that may also include captive breeding, but it's done on Puerto Rico. It's not done by putting these birds in far-flung places. So that completes our first round of, of, of interesting topics, but let's, let's open the floor here a little bit for some, some, uh, some give and take between our panelists. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in on what uh, Juan Carlos said about uh, needing to be at this for a really long time. That's, that's one of our challenges. The, the funding comes for a one and two year cycles, and then they say at that point, you need to be able to completely funding yourself or they need to be doing it through ecotourism. We always say that the conservation projects, I used to say it was 25 years, I now say 50 years. It's a two, three, four generation process of change in cultural expectations. So we need to find a ways to support ourselves uh, psychologically as well as financially to be in this for the, the long haul and to train the people to support us. And so to me, these are two really important issues that we need to look at. Yeah, uh, I agree. And uh, also, we need to focus really on demand, as you said, because uh, the problem is that as long as there is demand for wild parrots, for pets, people are going to go into the jungles to take them out, out of their nests. And, and that's the, the whole issue. And uh, when you talk about uh, trying to uh, make campaigns to reduce demand, I mean, you're talking about a campaign that uh, is going to last at least 10, 15 years to change the minds of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, uh, very important because internationally, it has been accepted that uh, right now, the best strategy to work against illegal trade, not just of pirate, but of uh, all the species, is through uh, campaigns to reduce demand all over the world. So that's, uh, that's very important. We need to reduce demand. Um, one aspect of reducing demand that, that we found with our partners in South America is that, as Juan Carlos said, some of the demand, a lot of the demand in some cases, is local domestic demand. And that actually provides an opportunity to strategically focus your campaign to reduce demand locally to those communities. And so, for example, our partner, Asociación Armonía in Bolivia, has been very successful 
in reducing demand for the pet trade, as well as for ceremonial headdresses, the macaw feathers and the benny, where uh, the endemic blue-throated macaw lives. And part of that effort was public uh, education, as well as providing synthetic uh, alternative feathers that the local schools could make right there in shop and uh, make their headdresses and parade and maintain their traditions that way. Another example has been our Brazilian partner, Quasis, who's done an amazing educational campaign to reduce uh, any demand for the gray-breasted parakeet um, in Northeastern Brazil. And so um, that population through is, is actually increasing thanks to the outreach and education as well as nest box programs. So there's an opportunity, uh, particularly for the rarer species locally to uh, have targeted campaigns to reduce demand for, for them as pets or for feathers. And on, and on that note, I want to touch on the, the pride campaigns uh, of, the, of the 80s and 90s, which were so successful, uh, certainly successful in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, Paul Butler's formative work with Rare uh, to bring local identity, a sense of pride to these, these endemic parrots of the Eastern Caribbean. One of the reasons that was so not only fashionable, but incredibly successful is that everybody could identify with their wildlife. And we see this with the Caribbean Endemic Birds Festival, which is now celebrating, I think it's 18th or 19th year across the, the region. These campaigns do more than just familiarize people with their wildlife. It also gives them a sense of empowerment, a sense of identity. And, and in Dominica, uh, the Colonago people believe that they will be incarnated as parents. We have a tremendous cultural affinity for these birds' identities. When that resource leaves that range state, for whatever reason, whether it's because a, a government official was influenced by the promise of, of all sorts of uh, grandiose things, or whether it was because of a mistake, or whether it was because of an illegal act. The point is when that resource leaves that country, those countries lose their sovereignty, they lose their identity. And in many cases, they lose their ability to get those animals back. And there may not be a safe route to do it because those animals are commingled with other species and for, with other uh, expat uh, parrots that are kept abroad. So I, I think pride starts with keeping your resource close to home. Mayor? Uh, yeah, sure I do. And I just want to point, there's all kinds of emerging disease and we've had emerging disease forever. And, and one is just the basic emerging disease that comes from our fundamental causes, as Dan was talking about, the climate change, lack of biodiversity uh, and habitat degradation, the instability and the fragmentation and vulnerability of our human communities. All of this makes humans and, and other communities, biotic communities, really susceptible to low welfare, infectious disease and pandemics. And these same fundamental causes are causing, it's another emerging disease. It's just flat out the suffering of, of parrots. We don't know the exact numbers, but 70 to 90 percent of parrots caught from the wild are dead within a year or two years and those that do live are leading diminished and shortened lives and our populations are plummeting i mean we we don't have macaws in some countries in central america or in one country because this has been going on forever and we know that fragmented populations have, are more susceptible to disease and low welfare and, and so what we say, if there's just no way to be having birds in captivity where they aren't prone to stresses. And so we say no cage is big enough. And as, as Bran was saying was about the movement of birds, we know that moving birds is moving known and unknown pathogens around. For instance, we did some testing in, in Guatemala on wild scarlet macaws. And I know of another study in Costa Rica with wild yellow napes they didn't find any of the typical known infectious viruses, but then they went and tested rescue centers in Costa Rica and found the beak and feather amongst other pathogens in the population of birds that were going to be released. So these are birds that aren't being tested and are going to be released and they pose a threat to the native Costa Rican population. And so you might say, well, let's just test all our birds. Well, as Brand says, we can't we can't test for things we don't know of and tests aren't 100% accurate anyway. And here's another thing about, especially where I work in, in Central America, these tests are not available, we can't get the permits, and they're prohibitively expensive. So there's just no way to do the testing. 
So for my part, it's just cheaper, which means it's more doable and it's safer to just stop the trade and help the conservationists and the local communities to work locally, to keep parrots flying free where they are. I don't think we need to be handling birds any more than we absolutely have to. I think what we have to handle is our own human condition that's leading to these diseases. And that's, that's my little piece. And Juan Carlos, what do you have to say? Well, uh, what I can say is that uh, emerging diseases have had a huge, huge impact on parrot trade uh, worldwide, but especially for Mexico. For example, in uh, 2005, the European Union banned the imports of all wild birds because of the bird flu virus H5N1, which uh, affected uh, uh, birds mostly, but also uh, affected humans. And what happened then was that the uh, parrot traders uh, looked for other markets uh, to sell their parrots. And Mexico basically opened uh, its arms uh, to these uh, traders. And by 2006, just one year later, Mexico was the largest importer of parrots worldwide. We were importing hundreds of thousands of pirates of more than 180 species from all over the world. And one of those species that uh, we were importing was uh, the monk uh, parakeet which is one of the most invasive species in the world. Uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, monk parakeets uh, were being imported. And then in 2014, there was a shipment of uh, around 2,000 uh, monk parakeets that came from Uruguay. And the authorities detected another uh, uh, sp uh, type of uh, virus, uh, avian uh, flu virus, this one's the, uh, the H7N3. Now, this virus only affects uh, birds, but two years before that, in, in 2012, we had a devastating epidemic of this uh, virus that practically destroyed the poultry industry in Mexico. So when this was detected, detected in, in a shipment of uh, monk parakeets, the authorities were really scared and they finally stopped all the uh, importation of uh, the monk parakeets. But by then it was already too late because over half a million monk parakeets had been imported to Mexico. And now uh, the monk parakeets uh, uh, thousands and thousands uh, got loose or, or, or were uh, let go uh, free uh, by, by their owners. And so now the monk parakeet is the most widely distributed species in Mexico. And, and basically it is recognized now as another Mexican species. It's uh, the 23rd uh, 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 Mexican species. But uh, uh, basically people really don't know and authorities don't know. Of all the basically millions of parrots that have been imported to Mexico, if they are sick or not, if they are bringing disease into Mexico or not, if they are, if they are affecting uh, other animals or the biodiversity or even humans, they just don't know. Dan, do you have anything to add? Sure, I'll just add something quickly. Uh, first, in regards to captive breeding and disease risk, captive breeding and release is the last desperate option for conserving parrots. It's difficult and it's expensive. It is much more cost effective to conserve parrots through adequate action for populations in the wild to avoid this expensive and difficult option. Um, so if it is the last option, particularly for Puerto Rican parrots or species that are extinct in the wild, much care needs to be taken to avoid introducing diseases from captivity into the wild. And if it must be done, building capacity for such captive breeding efforts in range countries is very important. So that's what I've got. Back to you, Paul. I agree. And I just want to add a footnote um, regarding diseases and trade, uh, which is that we, we've actually been here before. Um, there's a, a very interesting bit of literature on the psittacosis pandemic of 1929-1930. And it should come as no surprise that the Victorian era into the 1920s was the heyday for exotic uh, bird importation, particularly into the United States and Europe. 
And parrots were very fashionable. They were fashionable as pets. These were wild caught birds um, almost universally. And there was very little known about um, emerging diseases and particularly avian diseases. And in 1929, psittacosis was detected uh, in a number of birds coming into the US. It turned out to be a, um, a global pandemic on a much smaller scale, but it, it killed thousands of people across the world and affected dozens and dozens of countries. And to put it in perspective, imagine 1929, 50,000 exotic birds coming into North America. That's an amazing amount of trade when you consider the, the, how much smaller our human population was at that time. But the take home message was because of that, that outbreak and because of that fear and that uncertainty and, the, and, and, and virtually no science on the issue of bird diseases, that psittacosis outbreak effectively deterred the exotic bird trade for the better part of 40 years. It wasn't until the late 60s that we saw the recurrence of an abundance of wild bird trade. This thematic issue of disease pathogens and the movement of wildlife from places where they um, live in the wild to particularly uh, captive settings uh, as companion animals or as as, as means of, of making of making money raises the whole specter of what we're doing when we mix biodiversity and biodiversity incl includes pathogens and, and and diseases and to me this point in time should be important to reflect on lessons learned sometimes distant that we've already forgotten about but also to realize that we are not by any means uh, getting a handle on on this from a human perspective you know even less when it comes to wildlife. We're going to jump into our, our next topic, which is as a, as a, as a prompt to our, our viewers and listeners to send in questions. We're accumulating some questions, and I think we're going to have some time to, to tackle some of those in this session. And we're going to tackle those as an extension of this next discussion, which is where do we go from here? Uh, what are the urgent next steps for parents? And what are we going to do in light of the current situation to improve circumstances for, particularly for wild parrots, but let's extend that conversation to also include parrot welfare and, and the mindset that goes with people caring about, about these um, special animals. Laura Kim, you're up first. Okay, I'll try to just sort of make this a list. Uh, one is we need the tools to help us work better together. We have to understand human nature and oppression and all this, so we need, webinars, we need workshops, we need conversations. It needs to be part of our capacity building and scientific seminars as well as in uh, funding priorities. It's, you have to demonstrate that you're going to do this and work on this. And this is helping adaptive change. That, that means we change what we know and how we think. And we must do the adaptive change for something this challenging and difficult to support our technical changes. And our technical changes are things like what we're doing right now, more dialogue because uh, we need to be able to work together and build coalitions such as uh, we met in um, Guatemala in October it was a scientific meeting of parrot conservationists and we decided to come together to use our ability as conservationists and scientists to speak against uh, the demand we need to just stop the demand of trade in parrots and make an awareness of that and so that that's a way that we can do and do coalition building and as you said and i think as many of us say we have to reorientate our priorities towards helping people where they are science is really good we have to have it as a tool but we've got this is a people people problem and we need to be able to figure out a way to support them from where we are especially in this time of the pandemic how do we how do we become pair conservations where where we are well, by learning all we can, by telling the story, by growing our human dimensions, abilities to work with one another. Um, and for instance, One Earth Conservation, we have a something we're called the Parrot Conservation Corps. Uh, this current module that starts in July, it's to help people where they are to learn everything about parrot conservation, everything about how to be the best person you can and how to support people locally where, where they are. And so this is a way where we can be in solidarity from where we are for where the birds and the people are. And so I really feel that from a distance, we can change the world. And uh, Juan Carlos, you're gonna solve it all for us right now, aren't you? Um, 
hope so. <laughs> no. Well, the, the reality is that um, in Mexico and in many Latin American countries, uh, people have uh, been keeping parrots as pets for centuries, uh, from pre-Columbian uh, times. And for most people, that's the only way they know how to relate to, to parrots. And we have to change that. We have to uh, educate people to stop uh, seeing parrots just as a bird that needs to be in a cage. And uh, that's the only way to, to relate uh, to, to these uh, species. We need to, to teach them that uh, parrots need to, to live in the wild. And that's where uh, the, you want to see them. We need to teach people how to go outside and watch parrots. That's uh, very important. And uh, also for the local communities, they, they need to, to learn that uh, parrots are uh, really valuable and uh, they can be really valuable for them and more valuable than uh, uh, being free, than uh, being uh, captured and, uh, and on a cage. And uh, in Mexico, we, we started a, a, a program uh, several years ago to promote bird watching in, uh, in, 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 in as an alternative to poaching, to be a, a, a more sustainable uh, way to uh, use parrots. And, uh, and for this uh, uh, end, uh, we have been creating uh, quick uh, identification guides of, of birds for uh, many areas and regions of Mexico. And uh, we give them to, uh, to, to the communities and uh, they can uh, sell them. And this uh, pro promotes ecotourism. And it has worked really fine in, in some, some areas, uh, so much so that uh, uh, some communities are now uh, protecting parrots more because they know it is valuable for them to, to have the, the parrots in their area. Uh, they know that it will attract uh, tourism and tourism will uh, leave uh, uh, money for them. So we have to, to change the way uh, people uh, see parrots and at the same time, teach them uh, all over that uh, uh, parrots are better free than in a cage. We need to stop demand, especially in countries like Mexico, where over 80% of the people live in cities. And that's where uh, demand comes from, from people who basically the only way they think that uh, they can relate to a parrot, it's in a cage, but no. And, and every time they go out, they go out on vacation, they can see parrots if they just look up. So we need to uh, bring this information to the people so that we can try to stop for real all the illegal trade that's going on. And how to then. Thanks Juan Carlos. Yeah, so we definitely need to greatly reduce both the international domestic trade in parrots our ABC's president, Mike Parr, and uh, the executive director of Global Wildlife Conservation just wrote a great opinion piece in The Hill that's online that people can check out about uh, doing just this. So I encourage people to do that. Reducing the trade would greatly reduce uh, pressure on wild populations um, for both the common species that are traded heavily and some of the most threatened species. Um, and of course, this would have great benefits for people in terms of reducing uh, trading wild birds and mammals uh, and reducing the risk associated for zoonotic disease outbreaks like the coronavirus outbreak we're experiencing now. Another really important thing that we need to do is we need to increase the network of private, communal, and public nature reserves to protect habitat for parrots and prevent the extinction of those species threatened by habitat loss. And just one example, um, American Bird Conservancy is working with our Ecuadorian partner, Hokotoko Foundation, right now to protect roosting sites, critical roosting sites for the Lilacine Amazon in Western Ecuador uh, through long-term leases with the local community. Uh, and this is gonna help protect habitat for that species. We also have um, great nest box programs for several species, including the gray-breasted parakeet in Brazil with Aquasis that I mentioned earlier. And just, just an example, when Aquasis started, uh, it was unclear how big the population was of the species, but it was only a few hundred. And in just about nine years of the nest box program, they produced 841 fledglings of this bird, way more than the entire population was even known. So that population is increasing. And I think that gives us signs of hope that conservation can work when uh, it's actually implemented. 
And then I also want to add to what Juan Carlos was saying about watching parrots in the wild. Many of the best places to watch some of the coolest parrots in, in Latin America happen to be some of the reserves managed by our partners. And after travel restrictions are lifted, if uh, listeners are interested in actually visiting some of these places and seeing things like the red front of macaw or the blue throat macaw or the leers macaw or the El Oro parakeet or the Santa Marta parakeet, go to uh, conservationbirding.org and you can find out more information about how to visit lodges that um, have these birds and, and can facilitate those kinds of sightings. Um, another important thing that we can do though is when disaster strikes is have an emergency response. So this includes um, for the pandemic, but it also includes um, doing bird surveys or sending equipment to partners, firefighting training or firefighting response when there are these fires or hurricanes. And so just a few examples of that, um, I was lucky enough to participate with uh, Bahamas National Trust in January on some bird surveys in Abaco, which was severely hit by uh, the hurricane last fall. And uh, fortunately there, the, the parrots that are native to Abaco uh, were largely missed by the eye of the storm. They're in the south of the island. The, the storm, the worst impacts of the storm were in the central part of the island. Um, also last year after the Brazilian fires, we sent some emergency aid to Instituto Araguaia we were able to put out some fires in the Cantal State Park, an Amazonian lowland forest state park that was burning. And that was very effective. And we're continuing to work with them on firefighting um, training and, and work in the long term. And then finally, with this pandemic, we're in discussions with other like-minded donors about collaborating on different kinds of emergency support uh, for partners as well. So, I mean, the last thing that people can really do as well that may be listening is to support organizations uh, working to save parrots today. So uh, with that, I think I will. Uh, before we do that, I just want to add one, one point for future um, efforts. I agree with our panelists. I think that's a very, con very comprehensive list of to-dos. And uh, as an extension of that, I'm concerned about succession in our, in our in-country partners because when we have these interruptions in programs, um, whether it's funding or educational uh, opportunities, we see that many of our strong players start to age out. And we have to bear in mind that none of us are going to live forever and that there's a, a collective strength that has to be passed on um, intergenerationally. That means that we have to be training the next generation of practitioners while this current generation is still active and still productive. And when we, when we stop thinking about that, we, we get these, these fits and starts and we get these opportunities for outside influences to invade and potentially corrupt or, or, or um, um, disable very effective programs. And I can speak from, from personal experience in the Eastern Caribbean with so many colleagues who were trained together through ICIAF and IITF. They all went through school together. They all know each other very well. Some of those people have been in the field for 35 to 40 years in this capacity and it's absolutely incumbent on those those government uh, workers agencies and the ngos to pass that expertise on to the next generation we need to invest in people we need to invest in all efforts on the ground that ensure that parrots have good custodians and good stewards locally as well as internationally now we've received quite a few uh, questions from our from our viewers and listeners and, and there's one in particular that I, I anticipated we would, we would get, and that's the relationship between parrot uh, conservation and, and captive breeding. And parrots have long been kept as pets, as Juan Carlos articulated quite well. Uh, I dare say it's going to be a, a lofty goal to, to encourage the human population to thank all parrots uh, being cage-free for the rest of time. But I think our panelists can speak to the issue of whether or not captive breeding, and particularly captive breeding for the pet trade, as opposed to captive breeding for recovery purposes, can generate finances and revenue to directly benefit parents. It is an industry. It's an industry that, uh, that many in the conservation field have felt um, feel it competes directly for the revenues to support parrot conservation. But I want, I want our panelists to speak to the issue of captive breeding particularly with regard to this idea of a ban. If we ban all wildlife trade, and we basically say parrots as pets uh, is, is off the table, what does that do to conservation? What is realistic 
I just uh, want to pitch this to the group uh, for, so, for some ideas and give and take. Laura Kim, you're first. Um, it, as far as I know, there have been no proven cases that captive breeding for the pet trade has ever had a positive impact on reducing poaching where the birds are flying free. Um, it just it, it just doesn't relate. The poach birds are, are somewhat freer, they're cheaper, and they can move readily in the market no matter what the captive breeding is. So I don't think captive breeding is the solution for reducing poaching. Is captive breeding a parcel solution for some birds in some areas, such as moving birds for recovery? Nobody knows how to do conservation. It's different regionally and all over the world. So we just make our best guess and go forward. But for me, common sense says because captive breeding is so expensive and it's so hard on the birds and it's not impacting countries half the world away, that that would not be the first step of where to spend resources and, and money to help save our parrots. And that's it. Anyone else want to jump in on this question? Yeah, uh, we did a, a thorough analysis on uh, the effect of uh, captive breeding to diminish uh, illegal trade of parrots in Mexico. And uh, we came uh, with the conclusion that uh, it didn't help, help at all. In 2008, when we uh, got the, the trade ban, all captive breeding of uh, Mexican species was also banned because uh, uh, congressmen felt that uh, if, if uh, captive breeding was left uh, alone, it would only serve to launder wild species. And uh, what we found out was exactly what uh, Laura Kim uh, has uh, mentioned, that um, basically captive breeding is a business. And so being a business, they're interested in making money. And th the way uh, to make money is to breed the most expensive species. And what happened in Mexico was exactly that. Uh, uh, of the 22 species of parrots and macaws that we have, uh, ca uh, captive breeding was focusing on basically the, the two species of, of uh, macaws and uh, the yellow-headed parrot. That accounted for almost 50% of all the production of, uh, of the ca captive uh, breeding centers. And so uh, for the most uh, illegally traded species, uh, like the orange-fronted uh, parakeet, uh, the Aztec parakeet, uh, and others, they only represented uh, around 15 to 13 percent uh, of all the production. And basically what, uh, what we found out was exactly what uh, Laura Kim uh, mentioned. Captive bred species are very, very much expensive than Illegal, illegally uh, traded parrots, uh, between five and even uh, 16 times more, more expensive. So uh, for people, the, uh, the common uh, uh, people, if, if faced with a, a captive bred parrot and, and an, an uh, illegally uh, poached parrot that costs uh, 10 or 15 times less, they would choose the, uh, the poached uh, parrot. So, they're not help, uh, captive breeding is not helping to, to decrease uh, illegal trade at all. And in Mexico, before the uh, 2008 ban, it was mandatory for all captive breeding facilities that were breeding species at risk, that a percentage of all the production had to be donated for conservation purposes. And absolutely, no, not one of all the captive breeding facilities gave one parrot for conservation purpose. It was only after the 2008 uh, uh, trade ban when they could no longer sell uh, their, uh, their parrots that some uh, captive breeding facilities started giving some of their parrots for uh, reintroduction projects. So uh, the thing is that um, in Mexico, we have all the information and captive breeding has not helped at all. I'm gonna jump in briefly here. I think the collateral damage that has just been described is, is just massive and it's been devastating for, for decades. And, and we see that because basically parrots become commodities. And even if it's in local markets, if an animal has a price on its head, then as has been well described here, there's a price tag on its head in the wild as well. 
There's another side of this captive equation with regard to recovery, and I just wanted to touch on that briefly. Where there have been XC2 populations of parrots for a long time, talking about animals that have been bred in captivity outside of the range states for a very long time, whether they originated from illegal populations or from trade, sometimes they represent a repository for some conservation action, but it's a very, very small percentage. In fact, if you look at the number of management programs, captive management programs at zoological facilities, research facilities, conservation-oriented zoological parks, the number of captive managed parrots that have sustained for a long period of time um, with, um, with genetics as, a, as a, a means of guiding management as well as demography, and the purposes of those efforts to connect those breeding efforts with in situ breeding and recovery and reintroduction efforts is such an exceedingly tiny fraction of uh, the total number of parrots being kept in cages. The truth of the matter is that, as has been presented, I think it needs to be reiterated, whenever a captive um, approach needs to be initiated because it's an emergency situation or um, that we're talking about desperate, desperate means, those need to be initiated within the range state and with the, the partners that benefit directly, not only because they have the experience, they have the context of that species in the wild, but because they are the custodians, they are the governing authorities for that wildlife, and that's parrots and, and many, many other species. We call them flagship species for a reason, and that means they characterize and they personify ecosystems at risk. Parrots do that in a powerful way, but when we reduce them to commodities, even those efforts that get a lot of attention that, that a species is bred successfully in captivity for generations, there's not a hard connection between that effort and a field recovery effort. That means working with that range state and working with those governing authorities. Then we're really talking about a mirage. We're talking about a fiction. And we've got to close that loop. I think that's a very important part of this captive discussion, far, far away from the issue of pets, which the group has very nicely um, discussed. Um, we have a couple of uh, other questions, too. We're running a little long here, but we're going to take them until, uh, until we all uh, reach our last gasp, I guess. We had a question from a PhD student, uh, prospective PhD student. I, uh, I'm gonna broaden her question or his question to a more general question, which is how would we advise uh, young people uh, getting into conservation, particularly in parrot conservation, this broader issue of how do we empower this next generation of practitioners and students and researchers to become a, an active and vibrant part of this community? Laura Kim, start us off. Uh, one thing is to, it's really hard to pay off college loans and it's really hard to get a paid job. I mean, we just need to be, be honest about that. So one thing I say is <laughs> keep your debt low so you can take jobs that don't pay a lot or use your time, your vacation time and volunteer somewhere over the long haul. People need you to be volunteering in relation for generations. For, for, for everything that you've got. And so there are all kinds of ways to use your ability and to contribute without it being a full-time paid job. And the other thing is just start volunteering. I know like our organization, we, we, we love it. We love to teach. We want someone else to do it. Uh, we're getting too old to do this and there's too much work to be done. So volunteer, find people, network, keep your debt low, volunteer, and often paid uh, positions can come up. And you're needed. And please, of, uh, and please contact me, you know, and anyone on the panel, please do. I wanted to jump in here and say, we're going to provide our contact information on the flyers and the, the notices for this webinar. Our, our organizations and their websites are, are, are noticed, but we also want to make um, a success uh, to, to people who are part of this broader conversation. Because we expect that this conversation will get bigger and it will go in many directions and we encourage you to have these conversations among yourselves and to organize and, and start a dialogue that can loop back to us and can include uh, some of the things we've discussed as well as go well beyond what we've been able to cover today. Um, with regard to universities and education, I think higher education is struggling with the, the disconnect between 
practitioner-based science and academic science. And, and you've heard today that most of us are digging deep on the practitioner side. We want tangible, effective approaches to parent conservation. I think this applies across the board to all the work that we do because we don't have time for it to be theoretical and we can't make those broader extensions that what in theory might eventually become helpful to, to parents and other wildlife that will happen soon enough. So to that end, I, I would like to encourage our connections to universities and other institutions to think about very practical, tangible, near-term, feasible projects that engage students and emerging practitioners in, in experiences. And that, and that can be, of course, as we discussed, an investment in local people because they're the ones that we need to prioritize. But we're trying to do this with, with FIU and the Tropical Conservation Institute. That's reciprocal exchange. Get people sharing experiences by moving people, uh, even if it's in a virtual sense right now because we can't physically move people around. Moving people's ideas around, getting people to talk to each other, people on the front line, people are doing uh, research, data sharing, making sure that the information isn't being sequestered in one camp when we need to share it broadly. At some point when universities start functioning again and we can, we can actually get people moving around again, I think we're gonna see a, a major shift toward a practical hands-on experiential learning and conservation because it's so desperately needed. Now we're about five minutes over our allotted time. So what I wanna do before we take another question is have everybody just tell our listening audience how they can get in touch with them and what is the best way to do that while we have people listening. And then we'll also post that uh, for convenience uh, either on a web page um, or we'll make that we'll make that available to to everybody that's that's tuned in. But Laura Kim, how can people reach out to you and One Earth Conservation? Um, do a Google search uh, oneearthconservation.org. And just to remind people, we have the paired conservation cord that is made for students and for emerging practitioners to get involved. And we're really good on email and responding. Juan Carlos? Yeah, basically uh, through email. Uh, my email is uh, jccantool uh, defenders.org. Dan? I'm best reached by email. My email is dlebin at abcbirds.org. And if you um, need to look that up again, it's on our staff profiles at, a at our website, abcbirds.org. Um, I also want to, and I, I invite anyone who's interested in um, trying to do a project or volunteer opportunities with uh, Parrots in the Wild, particularly our partners, um, to get in contact with me. Also, uh, if you're interested in a PhD or, or ornithological careers, getting experience is very important. And I would point you to the ornitholo ornithologyexchange.org jobs board. Uh, they often have postings and you can search through that because sometimes there might be something to do with parrots on there. I want to reach the Tropical Conservation Institute at Florida International University. We have a website, which is tci.fiu.edu. Um, our handle is connected through that. The Rare Species Conservatory Foundation is rarespecies.org, and you can send uh, communication to info at rarespecies.org, and I'll see that. Uh, we have a lot of people still tuned in, and there's a question that's, that's emerged that I think intersects all of our experiences here, and it's a more of a technical question. It deals with animals that are confiscated. Um, either they're intercepted um, in trade or countries are doing their part to try to stem uh, the, the influx of non-native species or to they've intercepted uh, animals on their way out. And the question is, how do we deal with that? How do these countries that have a strong commitment to their native conservation of species, not just parrots, but let's keep it uh, germane parrots for now, how do they deal with this increasing volume of intercepted birds? There are disease issues, there are ethical issues, there are practical issues. Uh, I want to start this one with um, Sure. Uh, as you said, it's just really, really, really difficult. I mean, 
you only mentioned about half of the problems that come up with it. However, um, I really feel it's imperative that if you have any kind of a parrot conservation program that you have well-trained and as humane as possible release um, capabilities to get that bird immediately into the wild. What often happens is the birds get caught up by the authorities and then the authorities just fight over who gets to take the scarlet macaw home. So, and it never sees the wild again. And so we, we as part of the conservation commitment, wherever I work, I say, if you guys have any confiscated birds, whatever you do, we will support you to release that bird and, and develop their abilities. So in short, we need rescue and liberation centers um, uh, throughout our regions and actually maybe more than one in per region. Because if you move birds from one part of Honduras to another part, and those birds mixed with Salvador or Mexican birds on the trade route, we're moving disease around Honduras. So, and we need, we can do it inexpensively. We really can. It just takes a commitment for training and presence for people who have the ability and to be in solidarity to work with these people to let them rescue and release their own birds. Yeah, well, in Mexico, it's really an embarrassment because uh, for such a, a huge country, and with such a huge biodiversity. Right now, there's only one official rescue center, and that's it. Uh, we used to have uh, several uh, government uh, rescue centers. They were closed down because the government said they didn't have any, any, any money to, to support them. And privately owned uh, rescue centers, there are very, very, very few. Uh, you can count them basically with one hand. And so uh, it's a huge, huge problem because uh, we have a big problem with the illegal trade, not just with parrots, but uh, with all uh, kinds of uh, species and um, hundreds or thousands of uh, animals are being seized uh, each uh, year and there's nowhere for, the, for them to go. So most of them die, basically. And uh, when they are uh, released into the wild, there's basically no, no, no official protocol on how to do it correctly. And so many animals are just being released uh, by the authorities on places they should never be uh, released or even uh, sometimes they could be sick and they're still being released and so it's a huge, huge problem in Mexico that uh, we need to, to resolve right now. It's an embarrassment. Yeah, um, as others have said, most birds, most parrots confiscated from this trade are not releasable again, unfortunately, because of a variety of issues, either diseases or they're traumatized, uh, various reasons. Um, and this also happens in the United States too, not just the range states. And so if, if birds are confiscated, for example, here in the United States and they're not releasable, then it becomes more of an animal welfare issue. And those birds need to live out their lives in the best conditions possible for them. And then that responsibility often falls onto sanctuaries and rescue centers, um, unfortunately. So uh, I'm, ABC is also part of uh, a Parrot Conservation Alliance uh, that brings together many of these uh, kinds of sanctuaries and rescue centers. And I know that many of those sanctuaries are coordinating um, placement of birds like this uh, among them, um, particularly when large seizures happen or, or breeders uh, fold and, and, and large numbers of birds uh, all of a sudden need, need help. And then of course, the last most important thing, this is why we need to prevent and reduce the demand so that these birds aren't landing uh, in these situations. So we need, to, we need to stop it at the source. I wanna thank everybody. We're gonna to have to start drawing this to a close. It's uh, 15 minutes past our allotted uh, time. And I, I just wanna echo the sentiments of our panelists that Capacity, 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 where we increase that and we give our partners the tools they need and the resources they need, they can solve many of these problems. If that includes rescue and rehabilitation. I can tell you that international partners, uh, the folks from IFA, were, were just instrumental in saving lives on Dominica after Maria uh, flattened that island. And they rehabilitated and enabled the release of, of many 
of the, uh, the Ariusa, uh, Jaco, Amazona Ariusiaca, uh, back to the wild. And, and it's so important to have local capacity. Again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, we have a lot more questions that are waiting for us. So I think we're going to organize ourselves and find uh, a way to, to address some of this and also to offer some suggestions and some and an invitation really to everyone uh, to extend this conversation to your groups, to include us, give and take. As we, we said at the outset, this, this is an opportunity to get a dialogue started and to talk about some much needed uh, issues and, uh, and remedies and suggestions on how to move forward in this very challenging world. So again, on behalf of everybody and our partners at One Earth Conservation and Defenders of Wildlife Mexico, the American Bird Conservancy, uh, the Infectious Diseases Laboratory, University of Georgia, and the Tropical Conservation Institute and Rare Species Conservatory Foundation. I want to thank you all and, and wish you uh, health and safety as we go forward in this new